big news on both the domestic and the Super Rugby front. Lots of things to talk about in this part one of two-part specials uh, for this week. Let's get into it. Here comes Danny Tuzizawa, back to Baker, Baker with the fin, Kurt Baker in for DC, and this may well do it, Old Glory with the try, the New Zealand Sevens legend, Kurt Baker with the cherry on top. Can you believe it? Welcome back to the On The Line Rugby Podcast, a show brought to you by the Believe Sports Network. I'm your host, Mike Nagi Ishii, and welcome back. Um, sorry for the wait, guys. It's just, you know, between the hectic holiday and everyone else in America really talking about either one of four things, the NBA, MLB signings, the college football playoff, and the NFL playoffs, it made zero sense to really get anything out there. It would just be bloated by all the football things, whether or not it's on social media or on the podcast side. And on top of that, not really a lot of news uh, going around right now. Obviously, yes, we're still in the off season. Most kickoffs can start till what? Maybe early to mid February at earliest. I mean, I know Premiership started already, but like we don't really get it here unless you want to pay, and I don't want to pay, so we're not going to talk about highlights. But anyway, um, let's just go into what are the main things we're going to be going over this week. Uh, on top of obviously our you know normal news and reactionary things that I normally grumble about. Um, over the last two weeks, we have done a kind of a mailbag, I guess, poll on both my Twitter and my uh, Reddit accounts. And we got some couple of questions that I feel like I'm very qualified to at least grumble about to a decent degree. Uh, so that will be a part two of the two-part segment to kind of make up. So happy hunting, I guess. Today is your treat. And uh, let's get into it. Um, I think the first thing, major thing that we need to talk about is on top of LA releasing their signups, it, um, their signings, uh, there was just a couple things that I uh, didn't really go over in the – uh, signing reaction and squad reaction post that I did uh, for that show, I think it was a couple weeks ago, um, was that Dan Holland's head had gotten signed. Um, obviously, a lot of people know just because you got signed to a team doesn't mean you're probably going to play, and it doesn't even mean that you're on, I mean, squad listing doesn't mean you're actually signed or doesn't mean you're even going to get minutes. So most of the time, I'm just going to go with who got drafted and who's coming from Rugby ATL. And uh, unfortunately, Holland's head obviously didn't meet both, so he was kind of put to the sidelines. But now that he's signed, it shows, uh, excuse me, a uh, preemptive approach by LA slash ATL to really get their uh, new, I guess, 10 that they're really highly publicizing some minutes. Um, I don't know how they're going to do that with all the guys they have on the field. But by the looks of it, the way that, you know, I, I think a team social media strategy should really show you exactly where they're thinking of going. And uh, if you look at their social media, they did nothing for Jordan Chait. They did nothing for Matt Anisev, at least to my knowledge. And, uh, yeah, it, it's just been pretty bare. Other than Holland's head, he's the only guy showcase on there. So uh, I, I think that is an indicative standpoint of where the squad is looking at at least primarily going. Uh, to open up the year. And I think that opens up a lot of problems for a uh, numerical number of reasons just off of uh, who's going to get minutes, obviously. So, you know, as we all know, or at least I didn't know because I didn't cover Rugby United when working with Rugby Pass or really watch Rugby United New York. But, you know, Rooney, I guess, had some promise. So here we go. Uh, he last played in the MLR in 2021. He led Rooney with... 111 points, 311 games, so a pretty good average. Um, I know he had two tries. A lot of it was off of conversions. Um, he has since been playing with, I, I'm going to probably butcher this, but Vaughn in the Pro De. Um, just based off his highlights, at least from his 2021 campaign, uh, I looked at a lot of things where he was named MLR Player of the Week, which was twice. And uh, he plays extremely flat to the line. Um, he likes to throw a lot of late balls, so he'll use himself and his body as a dummy to really just draw in more defenders and send himself out in space. Uh, I, I do realize he has a nice little burst off his initial acceleration. Obviously, this is three years ago, so he probably got better or worse. Yet to be seen. Uh, but... 
Um, I wouldn't say is necessarily one of the fastest tens I've seen on the pitch, at least in the MLR standpoint, you know, in comparison to a Rita Biddle or a, uh, let's see, it was another fast 10. Um, I, I guess you could say uh, a Cardi, but a Luke Cardi, but uh, we'll see. But anyways, uh, so I think the biggest question that I think this throws out is, uh, what does this mean for Matt Anasev, who was named as a fly half for whatever reason? I still think that's wrong. And a uh, Jordan Chait. Um, at this point, I really don't know. You know, you draft Anasev in the first round, you obviously expect him to have that impact. And I think he has more of that in spades, at least as a, as a standpoint from a uh, college player that I've seen recently than uh, Holland's head. Now, Holland's head obviously has pro experience. He's led teams like that down the stretch. Uh, Rooney, at least to my knowledge, was a pretty decent culture. So I'm sure he brings that to the table. Chait obviously comes from the Stormers, the Sharks, and uh, the Sea Wolves. And uh, he's been playing pretty solid um, through most of his career. Uh, I probably personally, if it was just me, would have put Antisev in 12 to 15 maybe 15, and put Chait at 10. But now having Holland's head in there, I think with the way that they're going, they're probably going to look at Holland's head as their starting 10 with Chait as a backup and Antisev either as a third-choice option that probably won't start, but that defeats the purpose of having a first-round pedigree uh, to then move as either a third-choice 10 or a, what, second or third-choice 15 behind Andrew Coe. Um I think that's kind of stupid because you invest all that money in that player. You want them as a first rounder to be an immediate impact starter. You're in a play from the jump. And uh, I just don't see that as of right now. I think that's a uh, bad look on LA. I'm sure they know more about me in terms of why they put Antisev at 10 rather than 15. I realize he can play at 10. I realize he can play also at 12. But I feel like if you look at the way he plays, he plays well with a lot of space. He has a gr- the decent leg. Uh, you, you could do above average, but he has at least average leg. Um, so you wouldn't necessarily see him going kicks, and he's definitely not beating Andrew Coe at that or in the step department, but he's just a gliding runner. He needs to run with space, and you're not going to be able to do that really from the flat line unless you're giving him that almost Bowden Barrett-esque decision-making that I don't think you're going to give to a rookie, especially in the MLR. It's just, you know... Even though you played, what, three, four years of college, it doesn't really mean jack if you're not going to be able to really translate that to get film to, you know, not only stay at your team, but sign other places. And uh, perhaps that's why Holland's head is getting more of a, I guess, push for the starting job. Uh, But we can kind of infer that and we'll see how it goes. Obviously, hopefully they'll publish their training camp footage uh, and and stuff can at least develop further. But uh, I think that shakes up a lot. I think that gives it a very crowded room. They already have, I think it was uh, Sam Walsh, the uh, USA 7s player also in 10. So now they have, what, now four to five talented 10s, at least on paper, uh, to perform at that spot. Now, obviously, you know, that leads into the question of, the age old question of is having too much of a good thing a problem? You know, if you look at a, for example, from my football fans, the San Francisco 49ers when they had Steve Young and Joe Montana, you know, uh, everyone has egos, everyone wants to contribute, everyone knows that they can play the game a different way. Obviously, Anasev, Che, Holland's head, and I'm sure Walsh all play in different ways. Uh, but I'm pretty sure ego is going to get at least one of them and it's going to break up that room. Uh, they need to figure out how to distribute the amount of minutes, not only between them, but between the positions to then put either Anasev in a utility, Walsh in a utility, something. They're going to need to figure out a way. Not a lot of uh, team guys are going to be like, oh, yeah, I'm down to just, you know, ride the bench and never get minutes or, you know, whatever. It doesn't matter how talented you are. You're always going to want to get minutes, always going to want to contribute in some way, and uh, that could obviously be a problem. So, LA is playing with a little bit of fire. It's going to be interesting to see how they get that done there. Um, as if we moved a little bit to the Southwest, I think the Jackals hit another home run. I think it's a, I should take that back. It's probably like a triple and like a double. So I guess kind of a home run and change. You kind of get what I'm saying. Uh, but they're both out of Toronto in the dispersal draft. I'm glad these weren't published till now because I feel like they wouldn't have gotten as much panache as I think that they should have gotten. Um, 
And that's just going to be them signing Mitch Richardson and Nick Ben from the Arrows. Um, still a tragedy that they're gone from uh, the MLR. I really loved watching them. MLR stats, I love you. You know I, I care about them Arrows, but it's going to be good to see them contribute, excuse me, uh, in another franchise, especially one in so need of talent as Dallas. Uh, obviously, uh, Richardson has played, you know, a lot of a lot of minutes uh, for Toronto. Most of them for the full 80. Uh, he's played and started in 28 of his 38 caps. So that shows a lot. He's a captain for a few of them, at least in the games that I've covered in Rugby Pass. Uh, he was an electrifying player. You know, um, he scored eight tries. I really love the way that he played. He's a very big team player and a leader. A lot of guys on the arrows I've heard respect him, at least in my sources back in Toronto. Um, from what I've watched, I watched a game again. I think it was against Old Glory, maybe it was New England, uh, where I'm pretty sure they got blown out. But like, it, it was just to the point where Richardson was just that guy. Like, you could tell every time he was trying to jump up and make a tackle. I feel like at least for a good three minutes, he was making every play simply because they were so injury depleted last year that he had to shuffle into multiple positions. I think he played flanker at one point. He played 12. He played fullback. I'm pretty sure he played 10 too. That guy was all over the field and he was making plays on and off the ball, whether it was forcing a ball to get out of bounds, you know, and to touch for a little bit of a penalty that would have saved them a try or, you know, some like magical tackle or just, you know, doing the easy things. As I've always said, when you're a coach or you're a player, you just want to see your teammates doing the job and trusting their other teammates to fill in for you to just everyone that does their thing. And we all succeed together. It's, it's the little things that really separate us as players from the rest of the crop. And I think that starts right there. And Richardson shows that in spades. I think he'll be perfect for Dallas's uh, leadership unit to get to kind of grow the culture and obviously to fill in multiple positions. That guy is a freak. Uh, I think what I was really surprised in though, is a guy I did not see until now, uh, Nick Ben. Um, uh, obviously he was picked second overall. So it kind of shows exactly like, how hype he was, uh, at least going into them from the Dallas scouts, they traded up to get him. So, I mean, there is something and watching the film from like what, three years ago, the guy shows a lot of promise. You know, he's a little bit of an uphill runner, but he's a thumper. I mean, this guy, you're going to hear this a lot through this uh, part one of the podcast, but this guy actually hits, he makes plays. Uh, I watched his sevens and his 15s highlights you know, uh, between, you know, getting textbook tackles, not going high, going at the hips or lower, dropping his legs, making those tackles, rolling up, get trying to go for a jack opportunity may not be the most successful, but at least making the effort to do so is huge. At least from a forwards perspective, watching a back do that. I love uh, at least on the ball, though, running with it. He has a decent amount of gas. I wouldn't say he's probably the most uh, fastest player out there, but he's able to take multiple defenders, whether it's with a fen. He trucks props. That should show you something. Name a winger or a, a 12 or 13 that can truck a prop. Not a lot. And this fool, like, dribbles them. So I'm impressed with that. Um, I love this high ball skills. He mossed a couple fools in a couple of ga uh, game footage that I've seen. I loved it. You know, I think he will develop. Obviously, I think he only played one game and then was uh, for Toronto off the bench and then was either injured in that game or injured in practice after for a season ender. So his rookie year technically doesn't count in my personal opinion. So this will be his real tryout for him, his real personally, his debut. And I think he's on a ball. I think Dallas is going to love him, and I think they're going to get more butts and seats because of this guy. Because let me tell you, this guy has some gas, and he's going to be a lethal, lethal player. Um, in other MLR news, before we go into Super Rugby and some of the interesting takes that they had there, uh, the Force did sign Tom Franklin away from the Legion. Obviously, as everyone knows, he's a former Maori All Black lock. Uh, you know, he's played two seasons with the Legion, 11 starts of 13 caps from 2021 and this uh, past season of 2023 when he's been in the games according to the stats the legion was seven and four that obviously bows well uh just showing that out there uh i think when i've watched legion games and i feel like i've watched a lot being on the west coast uh i don't think his name is really flashed off of me i recognize the face obviously from the maori all blocks but you know just 
I think off of impact and eye test, I don't think it really showed out to me. Obviously, there's something there for the force to sign him, uh, and I may just be reading it wrong. Perhaps I wasn't looking too deep into the Legion uh, footage I have had over the last, what, four years. But, hey, props to him. Get a better deal. Proud to see that. Good to see some players advance, at least in this league, or at least more, I should say, advance from this league into uh, Super Rugby. As for Super Rugby, I thought that uh, your socials were a little cheeky there, my friends. I don't know what you guys were thinking of when you guys did this fan poll for uh, players to watch. Uh, obviously, um, I share some of the opinions now looking at back at it, uh, but some of these I was just like, what are you thinking? Um, at least in terms of example, they voted, at least fans voted for Cam Miller from the Highlanders, Teddy Wilson from the Taws. Uh, Harry Godfrey from the Canes, Lalo Milo, Lalo Milo from formerly uh, the Chiefs, but now he's in Moana Pacifica, uh, Henry O'Donnell from the Force, and Jeremiah Murray from this, uh, well, formerly from the Taz, now, well, Taz U23, now he's with the Satyrs. Uh, as for Miller, you know, I wasn't, I don't really agree with how he's a player to watch personally obviously i don't have a lot of the schoolboy film that i'm sure a lot of people in new zealand know and love i'm sure if i talk to my homie the black jersey uh shout out to him by the way on his new gig props to you max proud of you my, my boy but uh you know if you look at the way his film has broken out at least in the last year um i did not was not able to also see as a u20 team that won in australia uh According to a lot of the statistical breakdowns that I've seen from Ultimate Rugby, uh, he's played four matches, started in one last year for the Landers, and he scored and converted. Everyone knows that try. Uh, it was really, I think it was him against Damian McKenzie in a foot race, and I'm pretty sure he beat McKenzie for that try. Um, just looking at what I was able to see, uh, he shows a nice bit of acceleration, but... I have yet to see how he will develop just because the entire 10 room is upended with Mitch Hunt gone. Uh, obviously, Joshua Wan is still gone. Uh, I'm pretty sure they lost Marty Banks and friends. Don't quote me on that. Uh, but, yeah, it, it's it's a pretty empty room. So, obviously, he could go into a starting gig now, and I'm pretty sure that's why fans voted for him. But it's hard when, at least for me, having not a lack of film to be able to uh, truly look into some of these players, Miller included. Uh, so I will have to look into him more this year, given the high praise, and we'll see what happens with that. As for another player, it was really hard to watch, was uh, Jeremiah Murray. There's only really one score from his U23 that I was able to find. Um, so I'm not really going to talk about him too much, but... Seem like an average wing. Uh, as for another player personally that I was more interested in, uh, Lalo Milo, Lalo Milo, who I didn't really get to see a lot of, at least on the film that he was in. I looked at all of his matches with the Chiefs. Didn't see much. Uh, I couldn't find his U23s where he played for New Zealand and had some thumping hits that they had. And one play showcase, one play. Come on, guys. You got to do better than that if you want me to see things like that but the guy looks like he can hit um as for his minutes i mean he scored mostly garbage time um basically in two bench appearances for the, um for waikoto uh he has a laomape-esque ability to run with power and hit with power um i think he doesn't hit he hits harder than laomape but he runs with that laomape speed um and just kind of this that sneaky power he has a little bit of a step on him which i really like and uh as a defender, he just loves to shoot. But when he gets home, he hits home. And that hit looked terrifying. I would not want to be at the bottom of that pile because I'm pretty sure that Fijian, I'm pretty sure he's Fijian, would absolutely destroy me. So, yeah, that's it really it for him. Uh, I think he could really be, at least from the, the limited, I'm talking like under a minute level of film that I was able to watch on him, maybe a bench option to an off-chance starter. Uh, for Moana in the centers of back row, he plays really at center, but I could see him slotting there. You know, he has that kind of mentality for forwards. He could be a chunk, you know, we'll see what happens with that. Um, in terms of my third place, if I would say that I really got to see was Henry O'Donnell. Uh, he was teammates with Teddy Wilson on their U20 run in Australia with the Wallabies. 
you know, he's a sevens player at heart. He replays 15s, but a lot of his, I would say, power is where what was showcased in sevens that, that I could tell. Uh, he has a full use of acceleration and power for as tall as he is. The guy looks like a like a, almost like a Matt Antisev, where he's tall and lanky, but has like. I wouldn't say that kind of an antisev level of glide, but it looks like he's more forcing the ground with some power, which I like in a way. Uh, he has a quick burst, but I I, I don't want to say that he will be uh, using his height well on the ball. You know, for as tall as he was, I expected to see a lot more high ball play. I didn't really get that out of the film that I watched, which was like, I think, 15 minutes long. So, you know. Uh, perhaps there is. I don't really know, at least in that. But that was also from three years ago at 2021. Uh, he's a really tall tackler. I don't really like how he tries to wrap at the pec and above level. Uh, that's not always going to transfer uh, transfer into super rugby in a huge degree. Perhaps he does go lower. Perhaps not. I mean, it was mostly sevens film I was watching. So maybe it's like, uh, you know, just trying to stop him from offloading the ball, which I know a lot of us like to do. But I was expecting more personally as a, from a center, at least uh, I would like to see him retain his leg drive more through contact. He did have a decent one, but I want to see it develop. And I think he could be an option if he's developed, but um, I think I would need more film on at least him in super rugby to make a better uh, breakdown decision of his expectations. I think it was a hard bite for first, but I think, I'm sorry, Harry, but Harry Godfrey, my boy from the Hurricanes, uh, you, you're going to have to take a little bit of an L here to um, Teddy. It's because, um, you, well, you, you'll see why. So uh, Godfrey is a U20 uh, cane and an all-black standout for U23s uh, coming from the 10 and 15 utility. Uh, he started two of his eight caps, which is pretty good. And, you know, for a young player, I watched, I think, one of his games where he started. Kind of hurt me in fantasy, but, you know, we're not going to talk about that. Uh, but he was a unit on the pitch, at least when I saw him, just off the eye test. Um, I mean, he has a nice glide. He has a superb ability to read space and pass and kick through contact. I thought that was huge. You know, when you look at a player, it doesn't matter if you do it in schoolboy or in some sevens tournament. as if you can do it against the best of the best. And I still think Super Rugby has probably the best of the best players on earth. I would dare to say that it's between, it was between them and the premiership. Now you can kind of argue, you know, er, but uh, yeah, it, it, you know, his ability to not only just offload, kick, grub, you know, through contact, I thought was insane. Um, I think he adds a little bit extra to the fact that he can play 10 and 15 just because the Hurricanes, which we'll talk about later, have a little bit of a problem in the uh, 9 and 10 and fullback role uh, in their depth chart. Um, so it, it'll be interesting. He's a try assist machine, I think. I don't think he'll be scoring a lot, but I think he'll be setting up a lot of fools to score. I'm excited to see him. Uh, perhaps Ruben Love and him as the duo would be a filthy 10 and 15. I don't know. That is my take. We will see, and I'll break it down in a little bit. But uh, that's really it for Godfrey. He's probably my second place I agree wholeheartedly with that him uh, being on this uh, players to watch list. Uh, as for the person I really liked, and this is coming from a guy that not only watched his uh, U23, but also watched his uh, games with the Taz. Teddy Wilson is a freak. Okay. Now, hot take. This guy, I'm serious about this, could be Australia and the Wallabies saving grace at nine i'm not saying tate mcdermott is trash that boy is nice but you know this guy brings a different level of juice and uh you know if he just fixes a couple things he's the holy grail i'm telling you holy grail okay um as for just a little bit of a summary and then his performance breakdown at least in my opinion before I get a little bit too hyped. <laughs> uh Wilson was a part of the U23 team that just won in Australia for uh you know, winning in home field. He played six matches all off the bench for the Taz and he scored against the Blues. I thought his score against the Blues off of just basically just a dirty pick and go off the ruck was impressive, you know, to go through. I think it was Mark Talea, uh, Kira Yawane and friends. You know, th that was some serious, serious guts and I, I'm glad he was able to pull it off. He lives on the game line. This is something I love. You know, I love when a 9 and 10 and kind of 15 can play flat and just either wreck house running with it or be able to throw at the last second. 
beautiful. Bowden Barrett, you used to do that. Now you really don't. Pretty sure it's a concussions, but well, well, that's a topic for another day. Uh, you know, he has an impressive step, lots of power. His fin is Marshawn Lynch-esque, and I dare not use Beast Mode's name in vain, but that boy got power. I don't know what he lifts. I want to know. I want to know what steps he's on because I need some of that. Um, as for just his ability in contact, he loves to get skinny. You know, I think that's a good thing. Not only is he protecting his body, but he is also, you know, obviously gaining an effortless ability to gain extra meters through contact, not just through driving his legs. Uh, and, you know, on top of his gliding strides on the ball, he's a thumper off the ball. This fool, I've never seen a nine tackle with such intensity and maddening strength. For his size, and he's a tall nine, to really be able to get low and light up a guy on the other side, then in mid-tackle now, somehow magically release, and then go straight in, and then secure a jackal with an easy takeaway, with no ruck formed, beautiful. Hats off to you, Harry. I mean, Teddy, you a good guy. Uh, let's see. You know, what's another thing I can think he could do? Hot, another hot take. I really see him taking away the spot from Jake Gordon. And now I know Jake Gordon is a nasty boy, but I'm telling you, Telly Wilson is the truth. This boy could go and take over. And when he's allowed to do what I know he can do, we better watch out. I think we got the one of the best players in Super Rugby on the pause right now. Also, shout out to homie Max Jorgensen. I know you didn't get to play in the World Cup, but you about to be a star now with Ben Donaldson gone for the Taz, and I can't wait to see that happen. Um, as for me, my personal players to watch and a little bit of some narratives, uh, they may be a little basic, I understand, but they have great storylines that as a media person myself would love to see play out on the field, and I think that these will be the storylines of the season that I think maybe in one topic a lot of people will talk about and somewhere a lot of people won't talk about. The first one, uh, well, actually, we'll, we'll go from fourth, in my opinion, up. Um, I think that the return of Ryan Crotty and the signing of Lee Halfpenny to the Satyrs uh, was an interesting move that I think needs to be talked about more. You know, obviously, a lot of people on the Satyrs know Ryan Crotty. I personally was not able to watch him uh, live just because he was always out for injury. And I think by the time I started getting into them around 2019, uh, he had left for Japan. So, but uh, looking at his film from about 10 years ago, so like 2013, 2014, he's a savvy player with a heavy knack in his IQ. You know, obviously, you know, being that I'm a, I'm not going to say a similar player to Ryan Karate, but I was never the fastest or the strongest player on the pitch, but I had a great IQ and I always tried to put myself in position to make plays or at least be in the best position to succeed. And I love to see that from savvy players and karate show that in spades and his highlights for not only the all blacks, but for his provincial sides and his, uh, minor 10 cup sides in his, in the NPC, you know, I really like to see that. Um, he is consistently putting himself in the right spots to make plays. Um, he's a great uphill runner. You know, he runs with a lot of power. His fan and truck are nice. I mean, I'm sure he probably still has that a little bit, Obviously, it's been 10 years since his uh, career was at his peak, really, at the peak of his powers. So perhaps a lot of this has fallen off. We've yet to see, but it would be nice to see where he goes with that. Uh, you know, he's a really just an oldie but a goodie. But I think what he does is he brings a lot of stability and leadership to the uh, Satyrs position at center, which has been gutted with injury. You know, you had, uh, what, Jack Goodhue go down. Um uh, you had, let's see, who else? Brayden Enor go down. Uh, Lester Fanganuku, who technically played center, but mostly played it. Wing is gone. Uh, let's see, who else did they have? Uh, Havili is played pretty much now in like the 10 or 15, even though he played 12 for a lot of his time. Uh, so a lot of instability in that lineup, and I think he'll slot in perfectly to really just be that one-two punch uh, in that center spot between him and hopefully, uh, you know, a nice development player or, you know, maybe Havili slots back at 12 and Fergus Burke takes the reins at 10 or Fergus Burke moves to 15 and Havili plays at 10. Either way, Karate, I think, needs to bring that kind of old crusader culture that 
Iron Man level mentality, and I, I think that he does that in spades. Um, it'll be interesting to see how he performs with the Crusaders. As for Lay Halfpenny, I was a big fan of him when I first started watching rugby in 2018. Uh, obviously, his, his uh, prominence has fallen off due to a lot of injury, but he was a legit threat, I think, when I first started watching from between then and 20, to maybe 2019, if you stretch it, but at least his 2018 season. Perfection. Dominance. I loved it. Uh, but his roster injuries, I'm sure, is caught up to him. Um, I think it'll be interesting to see what he brings at this stage of his career to the Satyrs, where he'll slot in. You know, if Havili plays a 10 and Fergus Burke is at 15, will he come off the bench? Can he handle coming off the bench? I'm sure you probably have played a good lump sum of money to get him down to Christchurch. So I'm sure you're not going to waste him in that regard. But, you know, He's a world-class guy on and off the, the pitch, on and off the ball, especially off the tee. I think he'll teach a lot of young kids in Christchurch and Canterbury how to play winning ball, and it'll be interesting to see his contribution there. Uh, I think that the next biggest one is where does Revez Rehana go in his career? Now, I know a lot of you guys know him from his Waikoto days, his Bay of Plenty days, and on top of that, his career – well, lack was standing with the Chiefs. Uh, and I think it was a shocker, at least with me, that he was not able to at least battle it out to kind of fight for minutes with Cortez Ratima and Tohirangi for that nine spot. I really did not like Tohirangi, but he he's still there. And obviously the coaches and Clayton McMillan and, you know, uh, Warren Gatlin just know a lot more about what to look for in a nine than I do. But I really thought based off his prominence uh, in that spot that he would have been the boy to be for the chiefs uh, until Ratima just went off and became a star with Brad Weber. Uh, you know, being that as it may, I think the crusaders for him would be like his last chance U spot just to kind of develop. Obviously the Razor's not there. Scott Hans is not there. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see where the satyrs go, at least in that regard into how he's going to play. You know, I think he's going to get the starting minutes over uh, a lot of the other depth. I think Mitch Drummond is still there. I think. I know Brent Hall is in Japan. Uh, but, you know, they're an interesting part to see where he goes. Uh, in terms of just where, like... I could see him slot. Perhaps he's a second choice. But he's going to need to do something. Or I think his career is shot. And... Uh, he may just have to go back to the NPC and just get some film because he's a talented player. I don't know what happened, but fix yourself. <laughs> Excuse me. Uh, as for my second one, I think it's going to have to be Ben Donaldson and Harry Potter for the uh, as the duo of Australia, really, at this rate. Um, a lot of people know Ben Donaldson from his Wallaby career. I don't think a lot of people in Super Rugby fans know who Harry Potter is. Harry Potter, yes, he's the wizard. From the books, yes. Harry Potter in rugby, though, is a wizard. Um, he's a fast wing. Comes out of, I, th I think it was Leicester. L Lester. I'm probably butchering the name. Whatever. But I've watched him play, uh, and he makes everything from running full field, making effective catches, uh, kicking, and scoring and finishing. His pride and joy. He is a wizard. Him in the premiership was nasty to watch. Uh, for all my MLR fans, imagine a 2019-2020 uh, Harley Davidson, for all those who know, school teacher. Mm -hmm. But he's a freak. And uh, it'll be nice to see him and Donaldson kind of go play off each other with the Western Force. I think Donaldson was an unsung hero of how the Taws played a lot of their games this year and just working through... Uh, all the injuries they had, whether it was through Max Jorgensen or, you know, the rest of their team kind of getting banged up. Donaldson was that guy. And I think him and Harry Potter will finally be able to just diverge and create their own path rather than being stuck with Darren Coleman and uh, Steve Borthwick and friends in that uh, old Le Leinster club. But, you know, they could easily be duo of the year, I think, uh, given the relatively thin rosters. And I think... They will be a interesting matchup to go to Perth and just watch them go to work. It'll be fun to see and fun to do. And 
they're going to be amazing at doing it. Uh, as for my first and biggest storyline this year, what in the hell are the Canes going to do on their 9, 10, and 15 spot? There are a lot of questions in that backfield, and I can't wait to see what they're going to do with this. Uh, the Canes are crowded really at 9, 10, and 15 uh, with stars. You know, in 9, you got uh, – TJ Perinar, you got now Richard Judd from the Legion. You have obviously Cam Roygaard, the freak of nature himself, who just, I think, tied. I'm not sure if he beat, but tied at least. Bowden Barrett's Bronco record of 4 413, if I'm correct. Um, then you got Brett Cameron and Aiden Morgan at 10, now having to fight for their lives against the homie himself, uh, Harry Godfrey. Um, and obviously, 15, you got Ruben Love. Um, I personally was not a fan of how Brett Cameron and Aiden Morgan did as much as the black jersey was. Uh, I'm not saying they're junk. By all means, they're not a slouch. But I think at worst, to me, they were middling game managers that I thought could have been elevated based off of what the Hurricane brand is. To me, the Hurricane brand is what Bowden Barrett and homies did, where they were flat to the ball, not afraid to run run through, not playing a game of kick tennis like what Caleb Trask is known for and managing the space a little bit more and letting Jordy Barrett play. That wasn't how the Canes were. I would like to see the Canes go back more to brand. Um, but with, um, in other words, with Perinar back and Richard Judd coming in from the Legion, I think that puts a big target on Roygaard's back. I'm not saying he's going to lose a spot. Don't get me wrong. But I, I, I think that forces him to not only learn from those two older players, but um, on top of that, always be battling for minutes, which I think is going to be good. Because competition always brings out the best in everyone, I think, personally. And it should be interesting to see. As for Ruben Love, um, I think putting him at 15 is a waste. Same thing with Bowden Barrett. I'm not going to go over this again. Put him back at 10. We've seen what Ruben Love can do at 10, and he's an absolute unit. He plays better flat to the line. Don't give him space. I wouldn't say necessarily say he has the greatest boot. So on top of that, boom, right there. You know who has a good boot? Harry Godfrey, wonderful leg, put in there. Uh, but the lineup, in my opinion, should be as follows, uh, at least just to watch Magic play. If they were to follow my plan and kind of be on brand with how the Hurricanes are, should be Cam Rugger at 9, Ruben Love at 10, Jorge Barrett at 12, Billy Proctor at 13, Josh Morby at 11, Celeste Riasi at 14, Harry Godfrey at 15. I think if they, they want to succeed and – continue to develop at least Riasi's off-the-ball performance and let Godfrey be loose, that's the easiest way to do it. And, you know, you're not going to get it by beating around the bush with this one. You're going to have to play all of them at some point. Uh, I just don't know how it's going to be. Whether or not there's going to be a bolting exodus or not is yet to be seen, but it'll be interesting to see. And that's going to be it for me for this part one. I will see you in part two. Peace.